All right. Welcome, Jamie Lee. Um, before you dive in, I do want to ask uh, a little bit about your first job in travel, if you can talk <laughs> about that, as well as how it relates to the work that you're doing now. Well, my first job in travel, it sounded really glamorous. It was air to sea hostess. So when I turned up for my first day on the job, they handed me, and it was actually for a destination management company in Barbados, I'm Barbadian, and they handed me a sign which literally said, this way, please. And I was literally had to stand on the corner of the airport, just holding a sign and directing air to sea passengers to their um, location. So I guess in some way, I'm still kind of guiding people in the right redirection you know this way please with our community of ladies at Bay Women and Travel. <laughs> That's amazing all right well I will let you take it from here so thanks so much. <laughs> so why does I thought it would be really good to set some context before we get into our di discussion and on, along the lines of why does diversity matter? Um, there are loads of white papers, articles, case studies that says that diversity is ju not just a responsible thing to do, but it actually is gives a competitive advantage. And I mean, in an industry where the customer reigns supreme, diversity and inclusion can give your business a massive competitive edge, connecting you more closely with customers, becoming a magnet for prize talent and ultimately boosting your bottom line. There are two really great stats that I want to share with you guys. And it says that companies with leadership in the top quartile for gender diversity were 15% more likely to have financial returns above their industry mediums. And companies with leadership um, in the top quartile for racial and ethnic diversity were 35% more likely to have financial returns above their industry medium. So it clearly shows you that there is a direct link to your business sustainability and competitive advantage and having a more diverse um, leadership team. So learn, learn about our the terminologies. Um, as we are a kind of a global audience here today, I thought it would be important to highlight some of the terminologies which we, which we use to kind of describe ethnic people from ethnic minorities. So we have BAME, which is actually an acronym, which stands for Black, Asian, and Minority Ethnics. And you hear that term a lot in the UK market. We have POC, which stands for People of Color. And then we have BIPOC, which is Black Indigenous People of Color. So those are just a few terminologies that you can use to kind of describe individuals from an ethnic minority. Ah, as Jill mentioned, um, I am the executive director for the BAME Women and Travel, and we support women from a Black, Asian, and minority ethnic background in the travel and tourism and hospitality industry to fulfill their economic and individual potential through customized training and mentoring and services aimed at fostering entrepreneurship and employment. We have an amazing community of employers, entrepreneurs, career creators, and career-driven professionals from a BAME background who want to build profitable, strategic, and growth-oriented businesses or careers. We are women-focused, but we recognize and encourage men to be a part of our community. In terms of our core purposes, so our core purpose for women and being women and travel is really in addressing racial inequality as a societal, moral, and business issue. And we have highlighted four key strategic objectives, which you'll see listed here. Um, to execute this mission over the next three years. Of course, the first one is all around setting the key KPIs and targets um, uh, because, you know, as we know, what doesn't get measured doesn't get done. <laughs> and breaking the beam glass ceiling, uh, representation. So as Jillian Tan just mentioned, role models are such an important element of uh, being able to see yourself in a position of power as a being woman, as a woman, as a female. So we really, that's one of my, actually that's that kind of my favorite target because it was one that was very close to me. And then as well as developing resources. So we create a number of resources for businesses which they can utilize to 
push diversity and inclusion within their organization. And we, for example, if you go onto our website, you'll find our allyship toolkit there as well, where you can download that to learn how to be a better ally in the workplace. Yeah, so we will be going on, moving on to our exciting panel. So the exciting part of today. And first of all, I want to thank again to Focus Right for inviting me to moderate today's incredibly important discussion. Uh, before we begin, just a reminder that we are going to be taking questions throughout. So if you have any questions or you want to share any points or comments, then please do put them in the chat box. Uh, push the conversation further as well using the hashtag FocusRight. Uh, we're going to just begin with a brief introduction to our fantastic panelists. And first up, we have Tayo, Tayo Arua. Tayo is a consultant HR director who has spent the past 13 plus years working for some of the world's leading creative advertising, broadcast and media organizations, including BBH, BBC Worldwide, IMG, and HarperCollins, and a number of startups. Her remit over the years has spanned across the EME, MEA, USA, APAC, and LATAM, and she leads with cultural competency. Next up, we have Simon Gallo, who is an advocate for UN Women, having been a development director and a policy analyst in the UN Women Economic Empowerment Division in New York. He's also a strategist for the Equality and Human Rights Commission and holds a master's in public policy from Cambridge University. Christina Liber, Liberd. Christina is the founder uh, and CEO of Voyager, an AI-powered travel concierge for the designated planner. Now, Voyager creates optimized itineraries based on the traveler's likes, destinations, dates, and budget. Voyager is also a community platform that allows like-minded travelers to leave reviews and tips about where they have been and learned and gain access to Vo Voyager's vendor partners at the traveler's destination. And last but certainly not least is Lauren von Stackelberg is an entrepreneurial inclusion and diversity leader, founder and charity board chair with experience in technology, travel and finance across 13 countries. Currently Expedia, Expedia's group's first global head of inclusion and diversity, focusing on employees, partners, customers and communities and co-founders of Collaborative Intra Industry Network, CEO Action Inclusive Travel Subgroup. Founder of Microfund in Ghana and co-founder of the Wealthier Network. She is a trustee and found of Founders for Schools and also chairs both Founders for Schools Diversity Advisory Committee and the Executive Board of Foreign Sisters with Cancer Research UK. Lauren is a list maker for Forbes 30 under 30 and manager today 35 under 35. Thank you all for your time today to have this very important conversation. One of my favorite lines is without conversation, we can have no transformation. So thank you very much for joining us on this panel lady and ladies <laughs> thanks for having us so um countless businesses have been reevaluating themselves in recent weeks following the horrific death of george floyd at the hands of police brutality in the u.s um, the black lives matter of movement has triggered incredibly important and powerful conversations in both society and business like the ones we are having today so to kick things off let's start with how each of you think the blm movement is prompting change whether you think that this is the start of long-lasting revolution and what needs to happen without, within businesses and society to ensure that it is. You can kick it off, uh, Lauren, <laughs> if you'd like. Perfect. Um, thanks, Jamie Lee, and hi, everybody. I think from, from my standpoint, I'm tired and inspired. I'm really hopeful that this is, in fact, a movement and a revolution. I think the reason it's really important is this is you know, one of the first times companies have sat and seriously thought through kind of what are we doing and why are we doing it and, and why now? And I think the thing that I've struggled with is 
people keep saying it's a crisis and it's an emergency. And I think companies need to remember this has been an emergency and this has been a crisis for 400 years. This is not new. It might be in the headlines and it might, you might be feeling guilty or, you know, stressed that you need to take action, but it's been a long-term problem and it needs a long-term solution. You're not going to fix it overnight. So I think for companies, um, what I'm, really energized by is seeing people go beyond the social media posts, go beyond the words and the marketing to actually taking anti-racist action um, to back it up. And I think the last thing I would say is um, it's okay if, you know, for us um, in particular, you know, we, we haven't been perfect. We've been complicit in not doing enough and actually transparently owning that and saying, this is where we are, this is where I am, allows you to chart that path going forward. And so I think it's a moment for companies to be really honest about where they are and help each other go forward. Yeah, I love that. It is a process. It's not, we don't expect it to happen overnight. It is a process. And as you said, owning up to where you are at the moment and then taking the steps to do better. <laughs> That's it. It's simple. Christina, you have any thoughts to share? I do. So, you know, I absolutely completely agree with Lauren. It is not going away. I think there is this particular fear that, or this thought that if you just do the bare minimum at this point and then hoping that somehow uh, public sentiment will lower or it will, you'll be able to just do enough to skiv off and then not do enough. But I think it's really clear. It needs to be really said that this is not going away that not only are businesses taking the stock, but consumers are taking the stock in terms of how our businesses are addressing this particular issue. How are their marketing changes from, from now and then? Um, and it's really important. And I, I think what I'm very much encouraged by is the attention that it's getting. Because as Lauren said, it's been a problem for a very long time. And this is only the beginning. Um, and it's my hope that companies will continue to take stock and continue to take inventory about privileges that they have ingrained within their culture so that they can then start addressing it, saying, we have messed up in the past, but we will do better in the future. Yeah, I love that. When you mentioned consumers, because we are in the travel industry, which is essentially about connecting people across different cultures and races and you know and, and especially now with the younger demographic they are very clued up and clocked on to what brands are doing and they want to work or they want to spend their money with brands who are being socially responsible so I, I, I really do love that point. Simon do you want to chime in a little bit about your thoughts on the Biela movement and how that is advancing change and whether you see that you know really pushing the dial forward absolutely and, and thank you so much for having me today and uh, for everyone um, joining us today as, as well I know we've been doing a lot of uh, staring at bobbing heads on screens over the past few months so I really appreciate your time and uh, yeah I mean just to uh, build on some of the the, the the sentiments that have already been shared um, I hope everyone feels when it comes to the Black Lives Matter movement a sense of energy and invigoration about it and um, there are people who have been talking about these issues for many years. Um, the new sense of, as I said, energy and optimism that the movement has given us uh, is incredibly exciting. But I think in particular, there's two ways which I've seen very, very tangible dis uh, differences, and they've um, been, been spoken about a little bit. Um, the first one is around education. Um, people are really beginning to take ownership for their education and understand what structural, societal, institutional racism, sexism, etc. means. This time, six months ago, 12 months ago, we weren't even having conversations about this. And when people talked about racism, they thought it was, for example, um, shouting at somebody in the street or bullying somebody at school. No, we're really beginning to have a greater level of education about how uh, legacy structures and institutions can create this level of racism. So I think that's brilliant. And then the second piece, which Lauren has already um, spoken about, is responsibility. The idea that it is no longer good enough to not be racist, but to, you have to be anti-racist. Mm 
And that if you don't take action yourself, then you are complicit in the structures that have been created. And I think those two shifts in the narrative, the conversation, the attitudes uh, that we've seen over the past few weeks, I find invigorating and very exciting. And that's why you've seen such fantastic action uh, taken over the, the, the past few weeks by companies. Obviously, it's key that we keep sort of you know, banging the drum and monitoring what's going on over the coming months. But I think it's been a fantastic moment to, to celebrate. Yeah, thank you, Simon. I definitely agree on the education point of view. Because so many people in the last few months have been reaching out to us as a community and really wanting to have those resources. What can I do? What can I read? What do so you really are seeing that shift that I don't think we have seen before um, in any previous, you know, movement. So I really am encouraged by that, definitely. And Tayo, to wrap it up with you, what are your thoughts in terms of the BLA movement and how we are, how it's going to progress? how the Black Lives Matter movement will progress. Yeah, um, within the context of, you know, diversity and inclusion and seeing that structural change within organisations. Yeah, I think um, when it comes to diversity, I think what we're going to see is more focus on leadership, leadership teams and boards and looking at these roles which can influence and implement um, change across the business. Um, having diverse voices around the table you know, um, lends to a more well-rounded conversation because I think what companies are happy to do or comfortable doing is entry-level internships, schemes. I call it initiativitis. It's like these, these schemes have been running for 10, 15 years and the whole point of them was to, you know, get us used to integrating and essentially these schemes just are running sort of, perpetually and um, they need to be made redundant essentially we need to embed dni into the business plan we need to link dni kpis to leadership performance reviews we need to look at who's um who's creating the work whose cultures are we leaning on when we advertise who are the audience we're speaking to when we advertise all of these voices are sitting on the leadership team they're not the they're not the runners do you know what I mean? They're not the interns. So I think um, to, and, and again, like Simon says, in order to really make this change sustainable and long term, it's going to take true allyship. So yes, do the anti-racism, disability training, all that training is great, but leaders need to ensure that the learning outcomes on, come off the paper and into the everyday practices and procedures. I had a conversation with a company earlier this week, but they have a super ethnically diverse Gen Z workforce um they're a startup um but they've all worked for major organizations or the leaders in that company and they're trying to phase everyone back to the office and what they don't they're having a lot of pushback what they don't understand is most black and asian young people live at home in multi-generational families so you've got babies you've got elderly grandparents who are shielding and they don't seem to understand that and when they couldn't believe it when i said it but it's because you look at their leadership team and all of their third parties and all the um, you know, outside counsel, they all look the same. So you don't have any diverse voices, you don't have any diverse perspectives, and then you're going to have gaping holes in whichever strategy you're working on at the moment. So I think we really need to progress beyond those um, sort of behaviours and, in essence, perpetuate the behaviours that lend to you know, truly inclusive cultures. Mm, that's a great point about the intersectionalities and we're going to dig into that a little bit deeper as we go further into our discussion really great point there uh lauren i'm gonna ring, ring, ring go, go back to you and i want to talk a little bit about how can we really turn the dial for diversity and inclusion and leadership from just having from just a nice to have in your business to now a business critical how can we really start to change that dial yeah, I think it's a fantastic question, and it's something that you see a lot of, um, you know, companies, startups, big companies reckoning with right now. I think one of the first ways to do it is take accountability for where your inclusion and diversity, which is what we call it, so I'll probably invert it, um, where that team sits, right? That team should be reporting directly to the CEO. That team should be able to talk to your board. Um, that team needs the empowerment to be on the agenda in all company town halls, to have their work highlighted in any company-wide newsletter, any company-wide comms, inclusion needs to be embedded throughout so that it's really front of mind to employees, but so employees also know this is critically important to leadership, to the board, 
I think the other important piece um, is taking it beyond your employees, you know, recognizing travel for us, you know, $95 billion is spent by travelers with disabilities every single year. Um, you know, travelers with disabilities are 15% of the world's population. What, what and how are we creating equity in our system or removing bias in our system to help support that? You know, think about women. Women are spending $72 trillion in consumer spending. That is more than India and China's combined GDP. And I guarantee you, you're thinking about China, and I guarantee you, you're thinking about India. So why not think about women? So start to think about, you know, who are you servicing and who are you doing a disservice to in the world? And how can you build equity um, through that work? And then the last piece is accountability. Something I'm really excited about um, that we put in place this year is having um, one goal for every employee in the whole company be related to inclusion and diversity. So we've done a lot of um, skill building around how to set goals and what those could look like. But ultimately, it's up to everybody to choose, you know, where they are in their journey, what that goal might look like. But it gives everybody accountability to say it's not the job of me or the inclusion team. It's everybody's job to move this forward and to kind of change our industry. Yeah, that's fantastic. You mentioned about yeah, it being, you know, it has to be, have a top-down approach. And I mean, right now, leaders and organizations are being asked to kind of step up and commit to that racial and social justice, dismantling the systems of racism and inequality start at the top of the travel company. But how do we manage, you know, that top-down approach with an equally effective bottom-up strategy without the kind of diversity initiative invariably getting stuck in the middle? Yeah, it's another good question. I think don't underestimate the middle. A lot of people focus on leaders and what leaders need to do, and it's critically important. And, you know, as um, Teo pointed out, then there's a big focus on who's coming in and the entry level and how do they feel and how do we make our company culture um, resonate with them. That focus on middle managers, people managers, thinking about who's making critical hiring decisions, promotion decisions, compensation decisions, those are all places where bias can show up and can perpetuate a lot of these inequities that you already have in your company. So you really need to be thinking about learning or in a kind of funny way, we're now calling it unlearning, <laughs> a lot of what you kind of have and, and really thinking about how to create a culture of allyship um, throughout the company. And that's not just talking about and defining it and having a speaker so people can listen. That's about letting them practice. Mm -hmm. Taking real life scenarios, doing role plays, working together. And I think um, for those of you joining the Ally Skills Workshop after, you'll get a small taste of this. But that's really important because people need to build that muscle. And people need to practice and get it wrong and learn and apologize and keep going. So I think that focus on the middle um, is really important. And the last thing I'd say is just going back to goal setting. Really think about the goals that you're trying to have your company aligned to. If you send a message that says our goal is to, you know, increase our black talent by 20%, does every single person in your company have the ability to influence hiring? Can people choose candidates? Do they interview? Are they hiring managers? If not, how will they contribute to that goal? And so you need to think about how they're creating an inclusive workplace, how they're, you know, eliminating, mitigating microaggressions. What are the things that everybody can do so that it's not just a goal that the leaders can do and it's getting lost as you said in the middle I love that and Tayo I'm going to jump across to you can you I know you've worked with lots of different companies and startups but can you give us some examples of companies that you've worked with that have recognized the need to do more with DNI within their companies and any positive examples that you can share that of companies that have kind of gotten it right <laughs> Yeah. So, Are on the path to getting it right, at least. <laughs> exactly. So I'm working with a company right now. It's a digital um, creative agency. They're globals. They have offices in New York, Hong Kong, um, London, Sydney, and Amsterdam. And, um, and like you said earlier, lots of companies are looking at their global ambitions. This company looked at their global ambitions. And to be quite honest, we're not reinventing the world. We're literally just saying what we said we were going to do um, years ago, um, but we're just um, delivering it at an accelerated pace. And it's just been really interesting to see um, the sort of um, DNI landscape across um, Sydney, for example, where we're doing a lot of work with a partner agency called the Agency Circle. 
and we're doing a lot of work with Aboriginal communities in um, Hong Kong. It's more the Indonesian and Filipino communities who are sort of marginalised and they don't have access into the um, creative industries. Um, the case in London is, you know, we have it's largely white um, male um, elite type private school educated. Um, um, it's, that's how the industry is, and obviously America, New York. That's the kind of hotbed right now when it comes to at the minute when it comes to sort of racial diversity. So, so what we're doing is we're setting global targets, and we're leaving it to the offices to choose at least I would say four DNI areas because I think what a lot of companies are doing in the wake of George Floyd, they ran to the internet. We stand with you. Here's our black circle. It's fantastic. But I think we have to be honest with ourselves and say, yeah, we want to welcome everyone into the building, but not everyone can be welcomed and thrived and, um, and, you know, progress internally just because we're not set up to do that yet. So who are you set up to welcome? I think I'm working with, so I'm working with a company right now. Who are we set up to welcome? So we've chosen women, um, the Bain community, which is um, black, Asian, minority, ethnic, and the neurodiverse community, so hidden disabilities, people with, you know, ADD, dyslexia, um, autism, that sort of thing, and um, people from low socioeconomic backgrounds. And um, again, we don't have those talent pipelines. A lot of what you hear, I think I heard a, th a few months ago, Anna Winter had the first black um, photographer take the picture for Vogue magazine. And when they asked, um, I think, I don't know if it came from her mouth particularly, I'm not sure, but she said something along the lines of, you, we can't find a talent. That's what we hear a lot. We can't find a talent. But there are organisations out there, very well-known organisations, who have the talent. And you can tap the talent from them. So we partner up with them. We don't try to create our own talent pool. So in London, that's, that's, that's organisations like DNAD in Sydney, the agency circle, as I really said, in the States, we're working with the girl gays and that sort of thing. And again, creating actionable steps. So and um, targets um, that, that link back to, to the global ambitions. So for example, we're looking to increase our global leadership team by 50% um, female, essentially. We want it to be 50% female by 2023, 25% um, Black, Asian, Latin American, what have you, um, by 2023. And again, we're linking those targets, those global targets back to the global MDs, back to their... Um, um, performance evaluations which again is linked to money because it's not really a principle if there are no consequences really so um, and again we're working on um, closing uh, uh, unequal pay gaps so unfair unequal pay gaps we're working on closing them by us by a defined period of time and I think that's what that, that's that's what new candidates want to see now competition packages aren't enough standalone by themselves for example as a black female that intersectionality you spoke about um, my salary will be hit twice. So when we talk about things like um, competitive salaries, we also have to ask ourselves, competitive for who, for example? And it's just those sort of things that we're workshopping, leadership are involved, it's a collaborative effort. I'm not coming in saying this is the way to do it. I'm literally sitting down, listening, workshopping, mapping out, and it is literally the global MDs and the global leadership team. And we're constantly bringing the agency along through town halls, Q&As, they're speaking to us, we're listening, and we're just setting ourselves up for future success. Hopefully, we're going to get it wrong. We need to give ourselves some grace. I mean, we're doing it. Do you know what I mean? I think that that's an example of a, that's a positive example of action, of, the, of taking actionable steps and moving them forward, but, you know, turning your commitments into more than just promises. Mm, for sure. Not that we don't need any more performative, performative, um, <laughs> post on social media and you mentioned something just now about of, around recruitment when you talked about you know a lot of companies say oh we don't have we don't get black talent because that's something that I hear so often whenever going to corporate companies and you know they say oh we don't they, they don't apply they don't apply to the job so I'm going to come back to you and we're going to talk a bit more about recruitment but I want to touch Simon I want to talk a little bit about the crisis the crisis that is COVID-19 and how that has kind of laid bare structural inequalities in particular for gender race and age within uh, society. How has COVID-19 impacted on gender equality? And do you think that this has pushed the progress back? And what can organizations do now to really support those female leaders? 
just a simple question then. No, it's the, uh, <laughs> this is the other one. Um, no, it's it's a really it's a really really important question. And actually, before I just go into setting out a couple of um, responses, I think it's uh, sometimes when I, I speak to audiences, I actually think while it shouldn't necessarily be the case, it is important to sort of reflect on uh, my my motivation and perspective around this. Um, and because uh, I often get the question of, uh, as as a man, why are you so committed to UN women, and why is this partic- a, a subject that you're particularly passionate about? Um, and I always give two two responses really. And the first one is is around the fact that I was basically sick and tired of gender equality being framed as a women's issue to be discussed and solved by women, when in reality most of the problems lay with men and masculinity. Um, so that was the first response. And then the second one is that, you know, I, it's, it's a firmly, deeply held belief that equality for women is progress for everyone. And I think there's a huge shift in narrative that needs to happen here, which is that for men as well as women, whether it's men who get greater choice over occupations, the ability to talk about their emotions more, their sexuality, gender equality benefits everyone. And that's why this topic matters to me so dearly. And that's why um, the... the um, the situation with COVID and some of the inequalities that have been exposed during this period have been such an important component of the work that we've been doing at UN Women. Um, and I just have to set the scene. This time in March, we were not in the greatest place. You know, we had, uh, according to the World Economic Forum, a uh, hundred years to achieve gender equality, whether it was down to representation in politics, in business, um, whether it was to do with violence against women or the economy. So we're starting at a difficult place. Um, But this has been a really, really particularly challenging um, period for women and women of diverse ethnicities, sexualities and abilities. And while I think there is a, I have huge levels of optimism now, and I really do because people are talking about these issues, men are getting engaged more than I've ever seen before. And I genuinely believe there is a desire for structural change. We really are in a a very, very difficult position. And I think, you know, there's lots of areas I could talk about, but broadly the three are uh, health, violence and work Um, and taking those each in turn. Health. Um, Globally, 70% of the frontline health workers are women. That number is 78% uh, in the UK. And women have borne the brunt of the crisis whether it is responding to these health situations, whether it is um, uh, people, whether it is, for example, nurses that have uh, had to deal with huge amount of stress and strain in response. You know, over 300,000 women uh, have died during this crisis. We mustn't forget that. And they're all mothers, their sisters and their friends. Um, and of course, when you take the intersectional approach, which I know we're, we're going, we're, we've been talking about in detail here, you know, black women are four times more likely to have uh, experienced uh, cases of COVID and deaths as well. So this is a real reality. This is a serious, immediate, urgent reality. But secondly, there has been what we've called a shadow pandemic, which is the pandemic of violence. Domestic abuse uh, has been on the rise across the world. And when societies under, are under stress, women suffer. Um, we've seen a, a, 50, a 50% increase in reported incidents of domestic uh, abuse and violence, but that's only the reported cases. And refugees haven't had the capacity, they haven't had the funding really to properly cater for women uh, in the UK and across the world. Uh, and, and again, this has really been exposed. But the final area, and of course, Today, you know, in terms of the the hospitality sector, the travel sector, obviously this will be a really burning priority and something at the forefront of everyone's minds, which is around the which is around work and insecure work. Women are more likely to not only be in more insecure work, but they have a three uh, they have three times the domestic care burden that men do. And so. As I said, while there is a greater awareness, education, understanding about the challenges that women face when it comes to the workplace, home, violence, etc., now we have even more challenges and we have to take even greater action to, to take us back to even where we are. But as I said, I am an optimist because the conversation is happening. But goodness me, this has posed some laid, laid bare, some really profound inequalities. It, it really has. And you know, thank you so much for setting that context because it really just drives home that, you know, diversity 
food is not just an organizational issue, but it's also a societal, it's a big societal issue that you have to take into consideration. I've seen Jill pop up on the screen, which means that she has a question from the I audience. I do, yes. So, shoot away. <laughs> okay. I like this question because it, it, it's a little bit looking at the uh, next generation coming up. So um, how does the next generation feel about diversity and leadership? And is it getting somehow easier for them to sort of start this, I guess, from early on. So. Maybe Lauren, you want to take that one. <laughs> um, I do also want to make the space. I know Christina hasn't had a chance to talk as much. So I don't know, Christina, if you have anything you want to add and I can maybe jump on at the end. Sure. So one thing I will say is that um, the younger generation is very aware. I think more aware than any a generation that there has been, that there's been massive inequalities within the system um, of society. And they're the ones who are really the, the, the foot soldiers right now as part of the BLM movement, um, simply because they know that we can, we can do better. And so it's with that that they're becoming much more educated. They're calling attention to different things. Even within social media, you see that that's their medium that they're using very strongly to advocate as to why things are wrong and why it seems like it should be intuitive that this is wrong, but they're still seeing these kind of atrocities happening, not only within the U.S., but, you know, throughout the world. So um, they're taking action. They're calling people to the carpet, so to say. And um, if they don't see the action, we're seeing very much, they're very... they take a very strong stance immediately say, okay, well, we're not with that. And they're going to move on to, to some, someone else or some other business that will take their considerations um, seriously. Anything else to add, Lauren? Or you? <laughs> the only quick thing I would add, and I agree with all of that, Christina, I think that's great, um, is don't underestimate how much this is going to show up in your recruiting. Young people are asking and they will keep asking. And if you don't have the answers, they won't work for your company. And they will go on blind and they will go on glass door and they will tell everyone <laughs> that you don't have the answers. And so it's really, really important that not just HR, but every single person knows what you're doing and why you're doing it and can talk about DNI to that, you know, up and coming, all the generations entering into our workforce. Yeah, for sure. I think it, but particularly for the recruitment element is really going to be very key. You know, they want to see and they want to work within organizations that are actually doing, not actually, that's just saying it, but they're doing the work. And as you know, we all know that they are very big on the call out culture <laughs> and jumping on, on social media and sharing, you know, the news about your organization. Um, Christina, I want to talk to you a little bit about allyship. You know, as a member of the BAME community, I am very, very aware and thankful of the importance of allies. Um, if you want to achieve a society that, is, that isn't just against racism, but is anti-racist, how important are allies in helping us to achieve this? Well, you know, I will definitely say that we've had a number of people I used to work with an organization called Voyager HQ and a number of um, organization businesses reached out to me shortly after George Floyd to ask, how can I help? And it's amazing that you came to that conclusion that you do need to do something. So very much so, you know, you're, you're realizing that there is a problem. I think, on top of realizing that there's a problem, you also need to understand what your role has been in perpetuating that problem. Because unfortunately, there are steps that our white counterparts, both men and women have done, that may have done unconsciously. Unconscious bias is a massive issue that sometimes, again, because it's unconscious, we don't know how much we're playing into the system. So realizing how much unconscious bias and privilege plays into this role of your decision-making really impacts how we can become an anti-racist society. So understanding your role in that, and once you take stock, once you take inventory of how much your actions, your decisions, et cetera, has impacted those within the people of color community, then you need to take affirmative action. And sometimes I think that 
phrase affirmative action really turns people's heads, particularly in the U.S., because I think it's somehow it's a dirty word for some reason. But it really isn't, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to right a wrong, a wrong that has been perpetuating for decades and decades beyond generations. So looking at yourself, looking at how your decisions are doing and taking affirmative action to ensure that your recruitment is actually um, balanced and that you're looking at your um, employment group to see, okay, what are we doing differently? And sometimes that really means looking at each individual office. There was a, um, I took on a particular client to actually do an affirmative action plan. And we looked at every office to ensure that, A, we're looking at what is the available recruitment within that particular city and how does that actually reflect that within your particular office for, for that city. And sometimes it is glaring how much you're really missing out. And it's not necessarily women as well. Women can also be taken on issues, but really about people of color within that particular city. So for instance, if you're in Austin, Texas, and there's a large Latino community there, but less than 2% of your workforce is reflective of that community, that's the problem. So things of those, those really actionable things you can do um, will really move the conversation forward into, I think, a place where everyone can feel that we've done our part to be anti-racist. Mm, sure. I'm glad you mentioned recruitment because that's a big element of it. And I'm going to come back to you now, Tayo. And I want to say, how can we ensure that, you know, ethnicity, unconscious bias around ethnicity, for example, is not a barrier to people getting jobs and being promoted to kind of senior promotion. I think it also ties in a little bit about all with allyship a bit. You can, you can yeah. talk to us a little bit about that. That'd be great. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, I think the way to influence recruitment is to do the work before you get there or recruitment's not going to stop. So do the work while you're recruiting. So essentially, we talk about unconscious bias when it comes to ethnicity and being a barrier to people getting jobs and promoted. Unconscious bias is unconscious. So we need to work on recognising it. Um, we, in, in the work environment, we have the power to make certain training mandatory, but it's not just a one-off training session. It's an everyday thing. It's... Um, you know, it's understanding what a microaggression is, for example, is understanding and microaggressions aren't always negative. Sometimes it's when I walk into work with Brace, like, oh my God, your hair looks amazing. Really loud. Everyone. All the time. And it's nice, but it's like, just, just say your hair looks good, girl. <laughs> just, it's so true. I'm sorry. It's so, so true. Anxiety. As another black woman too, it does pop in like, absolutely, that's so true. Do not call attention to my hair. I know it looks different. Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> it's like, you could just tell me it looks good, but it's, it's such a nice thing. And, but the, it just causes anxiety. So, so it's just things like that, that you're, you're going to say, oh, I didn't know, but it's not bad. It's not bad. It's not a bad thing to do. So, um, but it's just about, it's, essentially it's about that self-awareness and encouraging transparency in terms of um, the avenues in which your employees can call it out because a junior, for example, is less likely to say something and is more likely to just resign if things keep happening and nothing's changing. And when that company's not getting the feedback, they might think they're doing well and we never want that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, when it comes to recruitment, it's essentially the same thing. Ex extend your talent pools broaden your talent pools, reach out to people who already have these talents. And, and in, in London, for example, in England, for example, we have legislation where you can't, unless it's a modeling job or an acting job, you can't actually say who you're looking for, but you can be quite explicit. And we're looking to see more diverse candidate pools. We're looking to see um, candidates from uh, um, underrepresented backgrounds, from marginalised, more disadvantaged backgrounds. You don't have to say low socioeconomic. You can just, you know, be quite general about the whole thing and I think also what we're seeing is clients dictating so just like we saw when the whole world told us we couldn't work from home but then the pandemic happened and the whole world mobilized within two weeks and we realized how many um you know physically disabled people we could hire it's the same thing when clients start saying look we need you to align with our values as a client then we as a company start saying who are our third parties? We need to, number one, change our values and our recruitment strategies, but we also need our third parties to sign up with our codes of conduct and our, you know, sharing our values. And if they don't, 
we look at our preferred suppliers list and we say, you know, we're opening it up. You know, who do we, who do we want to work with now? And, and that, that goes for recruiters too, you know? And so um, I really just think it's about putting your money where your mouth is and being able to turn opportunities away and say no, you know, and work with new suppliers, people who, you know, really do share in your, um, in your company ambition and your values and your mission statement. Um, also, look at, your, look at your company makeup. Do a DNI census. Who's getting promoted? Who's getting salary increases? Who's progressing through to the selection stage when you do, um, when, you know, you're recruited for a role? Um, who's on, do you have mixed panels? Um, how are you measuring against, you know, interview criteria? What assumptions are you making? Really look at that data and the reasons behind it and start scrutinizing yourselves as a company um, and how you, you know, um, and, and, and how you recruit essentially and how you select because affinity bias is a thing. It's not always overt racism. It's, we all have affinity bias. If I see somebody who looks like me, same background as me, who comes into my company, there's, there aren't many of us. So I'm naturally going to want to help that person if I see, you know, they have that hunger and that zeal. And it's the same, but when everyone's at the top, everyone at the top looks the same, they're going to have affinity biases with people who share their, you know, um, cultural values or whatever. So I think that there's a cultural competency piece essentially that needs to be done as you are recruiting. As we are recruiting, we really need to understand that when it comes to racism, we're dealing with trauma victims, essentially, who's had a very public unveiling of what's been happening over hundreds of years. Everybody else has just come to the, you know, consciousness of it. So um, I think there's a, there's a missing cultural competency piece. And I think that's the part that needs to be addressed when it comes to recruitment, because there's no way anyone's going to see it. Mm. You know, it's a lived experience that you're never going to be able to pick up on, even if somebody tells you. So, you know, this is that ongoing training around cultural competency, which I haven't really seen a lot of because essentially it's a, um, it's a, um, a sort of therapy. It's therapy terminology. It's, um, mm. you know, it doesn't even come into, you know, the um, recruitment, sort of, yeah. You made some really brilliant points and some really actionable takeaways that I think the audience can really, really hone into. And I will try maybe, Jill, to get something written up around some of those really great points that you made um, around, you know, recruitment. And the, But Simon, I want to pop back to that question about intersectionality because this is a huge, huge um, issue. And, I, and, and Tayo also mentioned it when she talked about, you know, some of her Black, black employees not wanting to go back to work because of course they're shielding can you talk to us a little bit about the importance of intersectionality and in vaccine women leaders yeah 100 percent. i mean again this is one of those topics that this time six months ago intersectionality was either seen as a sort of very academic word or it was a word that people didn't understand or whatever it was and now it's really come into the you know, public discourse and, 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 and consciousness. So I think it's a really, really good space to, to be in. But I think what's so important, and I know um, everyone on this panel will be working hard on doing this, is you know, moving from the, uh, the sort of academic language around it to really using stories and examples of how intersectionality um, you know, affects people's lives, because it is absolutely you know, critical the intersecting layers of gender, class, race, sexuality, they compound and interact to give people unique challenges, risks, experiences. And I think through the pandemic, I could talk about so many different examples. But for example, um, if you look at particular uh, intersections um, between gender and uh, ability and race, so um, uh, women of color, but also women of diverse abilities, there has been a disproportionate increase in domestic abuse and violence. That is what the data is telling us. And without really looking at the intersections of those experiences, we don't, we aren't properly able to respond to them. But there's also been other examples. So for example, uh, LGBT women, um, and particularly uh, trans women, are more likely not only to experience mental health problems and violence, but also homelessness. We've seen an incredible rise in that. And again, without looking at those intersectional experiences, you aren't properly able to respond to the individual needs of those of those individuals. And we've really seen that. I thought what was brilliant in terms of not only having Black Lives Matter, but I know um, uh, 
in, in my local community, there were lots of marches around Black Trans Lives Matter. And I thought that was a, a real statement to show that actually we're moving from just looking at people in sort of simple boxes to actually really understanding that that, that complexity. And I love the, the, the phrase cultural competence as well. Very, very <laughs> diplomatic there, Teo. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but I thought, but I think, you know, the, the final point to make, which I think is so important, is that, you know, none of this is rocket science, right? Is that, you know, uh, uh, we, we've got amazing people who've been working in this space for so long. But ultimately, all we're talking about is institutionalizing the ability to listen, to learn, and to act. We've just got to create the structures whereby people in organizations and the government. <laughs> listen to what people are telling them, and we understand their unique experiences, challenges, and risks. It's so damn simple. It's so simple. And so, you know, to Teo's point, when it comes to data, listen to people, collect that intersectional data all the time, run those focus groups. Don't assume you know the answer. And I think this is where the leadership point is super interesting, and we've seen during the crisis, as led by, um, you know, uh, what's going on in, in number 10 in the Prime Minister's office. We need to move past this culture where of this, you know, sort of cult-like leadership status where one person knows best. We have a top-down approach where a set of people sit in a, in a, in a, in a, in a room, and, and a darkened room in a cupboard, and, and work out what's best for everyone, either at the, the, the social level or at or, or the company level. No, you don't know best. Listen, gather data, listen to people's voices, and finally, not only respond to it, but make sure it's not a one-off process that happens every five years in a strategic plan, but it is a daily, weekly, minute-by-minute -minute thing where you're listening to your employees, listening to your communities, and you're responding effectively. And that is really the heart of intersectionality. It's understanding that we're all unique. We all have unique, different challenges and experiences, and that is what we need to respond to to make sure that we have proper inclusion and equality. Oh, thank you very much, Simon. That was, uh, that was brilliant. Um, Christina, I want to jump to you really quickly because you're running quite short on time now. And I, want be, I really want to get this question in around AI and responsible AI as more businesses are taking on that artificial, artificial intelligence. Um, responsible AI is starting to take center stage right now. For those that may not know what responsible AI focuses on ensuring ethical, transparent, and accountable use of AI technologies in a manner consistent with the user expectations. With your startup working within AI, how are you keeping this concept in mind? So that's, that's a great question because it's, um, I think we're starting to hear stories of how AI has been, has been used and impacting particularly people of color. Um, when we're looking at law enforcement and those who are trying to um, impose AI modules in their day-to-day um, -day business. And so we're going to see a lot more people begin to use AI in this capacity simply because of how effective it can be and how it can move um, particular data points into, uh, you know, really combust them together. What we're doing at Viager is ensuring that the decision-making process is a seamless one. But in order for us to take in a responsible AI approach, we have to realize that the data sets that are currently available are limited or have been only created by a certain subset of people. So we're looking at, for instance, looking at marketing and we're looking at who is, you know, taking in this marketing. If you only look at my perspective from what is put out social media and images, we're only looking at it from a white standpoint, I'm saying taking in the people of color, those who have disabilities, et cetera, who actually are a great showing force within the travel industry. So as we are putting together and testing out our modules, it's very important to continually test them with a diverse pool of users, we have to take into those considerations because maybe culturally, you know, um, they might take a particular suggestion that we make differently than maybe someone else would if they had particular uh, disabilities or if they were from a particular uh, socioeconomic uh, position. So it, we have to be mindful that the data that we're using to justify our decisions are slanted to a particular subset. And until we can start creating uh, really diverse data points that really addresses all kinds of users, we have to be mindful that this, the AI that we have right now is not foolproof. 
Um, so we've been working very tirelessly in ensuring that we're bringing on users to continually, what I say, break the system and to continually input things that we, as, our, as we build up our own data sets and our own APIs to ensure that um, we can address everyone across the board. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. I've seen Jill pop up on the screen, which means she has loads of extra yes, questions for I us. Do. <laughs> I do. Um, I will note that we only have about five minutes and that um, for anyone that has to, is going to the allyship workshop, that begins uh, right at the, right at uh, 1430. So, or 1530. My, my American time is wrong, but um, <laughs> so go ahead and switch over to that in a few minutes. But um, Yes, we've got a lot of good questions, and if anyone else has any, put them in the chat box. But um, this kind of just leads with the AI conversation we were just having. We, someone asked, how will the computer HR matrix train so they won't clear out minority candidates? Oh, mm, interesting. That's a good one. Um, Kyle, maybe you want to take that, or should I take it from an AI standpoint? Sorry, you, you take it. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I think it's more an AI question. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, I think it, particularly with, with AI, again, it's about those data, those, those data sets that we're using to train modules, right? And so in order, the way AI works is that we tell them to look for certain things, allow that to filter down into things that, into a much smaller group that we can begin to cluster um, information and users. So the way it works with these particular um, HR systems and trying to find particular uh, skill sets, sometimes we're looking for particular names or familiarity with particular names that, again, may not be, uh, that may not be considered a, a, a normal name. So for instance, you know, my name, last name is Liber, that is not a very common name, though, if you're in the Caribbean, that'd be something completely different. But, however, it may not be a Jones, it may not be a Smith. Um, and so sometimes also looking at locality of where someone's living, that could also be somewhere um, where we start shifting out information that could be someone who might fit in with our culture. So we have to, be, again, it's, um, it's one of the questions that you need to start asking your providers who are providing you with this software to ask, where are you getting your data sets from? How is this working? And do you have diverse data sets to train your modules? And so those questions are actually quite intelligent questions because I don't think majority of sales personnel really are getting trained uh, to answer those kind of things. But it's really important if diversity is important for you. Um, so it's, I'm hoping in the future, as we get more advanced in training modules, that we are doing better with this kind of shift. Great. All right. So this might be our last question due to time. But um, all right. This says, to our Black participants, many of the people in the Black community we have been talking to expressed feeling overwhelmed, sudden responsibility to speak out for their communities, generally sudden attention. Uh, Christina spoke about this being unsure of truthfulness previously. And as leaders, how do you approach it? How do you approach making changes sustainable? For me, it starts with conversation. <laughs> it starts with having the conversation. Conversation is inevitably equals transformation. Being open and being honest and knowing that, you know, it, it, that it, it, there's no perfect way. And we don't expect, I don't think that we as a community that we expect you to have all the answers. Uh, but being open to sit and have conversation with us, have dialogue around and not having that aggressive. Because I mean, for, for me personally, and from a lot of people that I've spoken to, you know, it's been refreshing to be able to have those conversations with individuals. From beforehand, it was like, if we bring it up, we are being, you know, what's that word? We're being too, you know, we, we, we picking up things that are not necessarily things, but no, we're actually able to have those conversations. I think it really does start as a leader in the organization. I 100% think that it really starts with having an open dialogue with your uh, people from ethnic backgrounds. Same. Um, one thing that we've been having a conversation about is also, I mean, within the startup world is just VCs as well, too. And the fact that they are coming 
forward to have these conversations is really important. And so um, one thing that I think it has to be very clear, though, that not everyone is within this space. I mean, the reason why Jamie and Tayo are here is because we feel comfortable about having these conversations and not all Black people feel comfortable because some of them are generally tired and they don't want to have these kind of conversations or they're not, or they're not equipped to have these kind of conversations without maybe um, having a very emotional uh, reaction to it. So um, be mindful of that. Don't expect everyone is, is able to, to conduct a conversation like that. But those who are, um, again, like Jamie said, just be open and be mindful um, and absorb and sometimes it's hard. And I, again, I want to give a shout out to, to Pluto, the startup Pluto that had an amazing, an amazing platform of them trying to uh, change how they were conducting their business. And so it's hard. But if you're wanting to get there, none of us are ever shy about doing hard work. Yeah. Uh, I that's, agree. That's a, so, go ahead, Tayo. Go ahead, Tayo. We yeah, get Tayo a little. I'm going to quickly say I agree. Yeah. And I think um, for leaders, the only job they have to do um, is to ask people if they're all right, what do you need from me right now? And how can I make that happen? And then go away and find out how to fix it because there are experts out there. They're very easy to find. Um, so, yeah. And there's lots of research and there's lots of books. Go do some research on your own as well. <laughs> Read. And if you don't have the time, Read. find someone. Hire an expert. Like, Read. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Jamie Lee. Thank you, Christina, Tayo, Lauren, Simon, Jill. Um, we really appreciate your time. Standing on the sideline is not good enough. We know that from, from Gillian. It's business critical to embed DNI into our strategy. Learning outcomes have to come off the paper, Tayo. This is a legacy long-term problem that needs a long-term solution. Thank you all so much for your time and for sharing your expertise with us. We are also going to, I'm going to share one other uh, slide with you quickly uh, with everyone who's watching to say that there are some great actions that you can take. Uh, we're a participant in the CEO Action for Inclusion and Diversity. Expedia heads up the travel subgroup. There are over 850 uh, CEOs across 85 industries who are dedicated to finding best practices, cultivating trusting workplaces. Uh, you should be signed up if you're not as your, as your company. There are only a handful of travel companies. Uh, a great way to take action to move forward. Thanks again to uh, World Aviation Festival and, and the audience that's live streaming now watching this session. We appreciate your support and, uh, and spreading the message. For those of you who would like to continue the conversation, you just need to go back into the platform, the Swap Card platform, uh, and click on the networking event within the day, September 2nd, and this session. It's right at the bottom. So we'll be moving over there now. And then also those of you who've already signed up and been accepted to the Ally Skills Workshop, that is starting now. Please uh, hop on over by using the link that you received in your uh, Outlook invitation. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for participating in the diversity in leadership uh, session at Focus Right, and hope you will also be participating as we move into innovation and center stage in the next couple of days. Many thanks.